Okay, folks, this is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Arrow 3261, Lecture 18 on Shear Center. Shear Center is closely aligned with what we studied for the shear forces on thin walled sections. We looked at shear flows and we looked at shear stresses, and this is a closely aligned topic. If you imagine a C-channel being loaded with a transfer shear, that C-channel, if you load it up roughly through the centroid, will twist under the loading as shown in figure A here. If we look closer at the cross section, we see the section looks something like this. The shear force, if it were aligned through the centroid of the part, would be going right here. And we can see, in order to react that, the reactive shear flows would have to be acting like this, which means they're going to continue like this throughout the part. Now we can see that we've got this shear flow, which is going from 0 to some value here, from 0 to some value here, and from that value to some other value. This is the shear flow at the CG. This is the shear flow at this point shear flow at that point and so on, we can see that shear flow, that Q times this distance uh, will uh, over 2 will give us the force in each flange. We've got a force in this flange, we've got a force in this flange, and we've got a force in this flange. If we sum our moments about this point right here, point A, we see we've got this force times this distance plus this force times this distance has got to be equal to zero which means it can't because this has to be if this is downward and this reactive shear flow is applied this way or shear force is applied this way these will never balance what that means is this section is going to have a torque if we call this let's call this h and let's call this uh this dimension here, uh, let's call it E for example, actually I don't want to use E, let's call it D for example, then F of the flange times H, we're summing moments in this direction, it's got to be equal to zero, then FH plus the vertical shear times that little eccentric distance is going to be equal to the torque on the section. This section's in torque, the shear stress is going to be TT over J in each of the little flanges. And because this has, this thin walled section has a relatively low J, this thing will twist quite a bit. Our angle of twist, TL over GJ, will be huge because the J is small. If, however, we had that same section, and if, for example, we loaded it out here, like by putting a little welded piece on the part like this, now we can look this distance from the center of that flange to here, let's call this D for a minute, once again our reactive shear flows are going to be going through the middle of this, and the middle of this, and the middle of this, and therefore the shear force in that flange and that flange and that flange are like this. When we sum our forces, if this is FF, we see FF times that H dimension. And now since V is over here, that's going to be minus V times E equals zero. And now we can set the, find this location. Actually, we called this D, didn't we? We can find this location D where the torque on this section is zero. That would be for this particular part HFF over V. And we call that the shear center and we usually use the symbol E for shear center. You'll see in this slide we've got an equation, a canned equation. The shear center is the flange force times that distance. This is calling the height dimension between the center of the upper and lower flanges D divided by the vertical shear force, which in this case is P. Now this equation looks like it always applies. Now this equation will apply for a C channel that's got symmetric sized flanges and located flanges, but it is not a general equation that can be applied to everything else. 
we can actually solve for the shear center for any section and it happens to simplify to this simple equation for this particular section. If we had actually placed the force at this, at this shear center, as you can see in figure D here from Beer and Johnson, rather than at the centroid of the part like we saw in figure A, then actually the torque introduced by that force being off the centroid will perfectly balance the torque that develops in the section due to the reacting shear flows as you can see those forces from those shear flows in figure C. That means doesn't mean the sh that the section is under no torsion. It means that the applied force is located so that the torsion that applies is perfectly balanced by the reactive shear flows. So the net torque is zero and the section will not twist. This is valuable in structural design, especially when we have thin walled sections like this. As we're going through this discussion, don't forget, in order to do this, what we're going to have to do first is calculate the shear flows in the section. That means we're going to have to first calculate the I of the section. We're going to have to calculate, we know the shear flow here is zero. The sh we calculate the shear flow here. That's this value. This one has the same magnitude as does this one and this one. So if we call this QA, we can call this one QB at these two points, which is also both of these two points are both QB. This is also QA, zero. And then we can calculate the Q at the CG, which is this value. And we know this is not a linear function. It's decaying like this, right? This is Q at the CG. Now we can calculate the area of this, which is just if this is B, then it's just QB times B over 2. That's the flange force. And if we needed, we normally won't have to calculate this for a simple section. If we needed the flange force in this section, we would take the area under this, which means QB times this height dimension plus Q. CG minus QB times two-thirds of this height dimension. Remember how we did that? Now when we need to calculate all of our shear flows and all of the forces, we're going to have to go through that whole process. But in order to calculate the shear center, all we really are going to have to do often for a section like this is say, hey, wait a minute. Since if focusing on figure C here, we see we're going to get three flange forces. Now these are actually what's shown here are equivalent flange forces rather than the reactive like I showed you before. Okay, so you got to be a little careful. That's why this is equal to this because these are the equivalent values, not the reactive values. Normally all we need to do for a simple section like this, we know that the shear flow here is zero. We can calculate the shear flow here. That gives us this value. We can calculate the force in the flange for, by the area under this curve. And then if we sum the moments about this, if we sum the moment about a convenient point, you'll notice these two forces don't come into the summation. All we're left with is this force and our vertical shear times whatever shear center we have. Therefore, the quickest way to solve these a lot of times, we can just quickly sum forces, like for a section like this, we calculate one shear flow here, then calculate the force in the flange from that shear flow, and then sum the moments about this point, and then that will give us whatever the shear flow is as a function of that force and these dimensions. If we have a section like, let's make an unsymmetric section like this, what we could do is the same thing. We could calculate, say, the shear flow right here, because we know here it's zero, at point A it's zero, at point B we have something, it's going to be growing like this. We know we're going to get flange forces based on that. We can calculate the flange force. We could calculate all these flange forces, we don't need it because if we sum our moments about right there, then we find all of those forces drop out except for this force and wherever this vertical shear is.
if we have a section like this, we can do the same thing. We can actually just calculate one shear flow right here, right there. We know this is zero, this is that. Some are moments about, actually we're going to need two because we're going to also need this one. This is going to build up like this. So we need the force in this flange and the force in this flange and then we can sum our moments about this point to calculate our shear center. Does that make sense? Anyway, that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. What we're saying here is when we have a section that's not, uh, I'll call it sufficiently symmetric, then we will find it may undergo twist when the loads are applied through the CG. And we can verify uh, we can get rid of that twist by calculating the shear center and then placing the force there instead of at the centroid of the section. And although many texts will go into a lot of calculus for calculating what those shear flows are, what all the forces are, usually if all we're looking for is the shear center, we can often get away, a clever individual can get away with just calculating one or two shear flows and then the force associated with those shear flows and then summing moments in a clever manner to get the shear center. That's where we're headed. Let's move forward. This is showing if we have, if you look at figure 637, we see a C channel, but because, and it's loaded through the centroid, but because it's loaded in a plane of symmetry, it doesn't twist. We get a transfer shear and a moment as we see in figure 638, but there's no twist. However, although this section has one plane of symmetry, if we instead loaded it like we see in figure 640, so it's not loaded in a plane of symmetry, now we will get both a shear and a moment, and we will get twist because the force is not at the shear center. Now it is true that we can calculate the, the shear stress VQ over IT. However, that's not the complete shear stress because we're also going to get a TT over J because there is a torque on this section. That's what that says. This is showing what we saw before, how we can have, and what we see if you look at the first figure, figure 642, we see what we have here are the equivalent uh, shear flows and the equivalent flange forces. And in figure 643 we see how if we had placed the vertical shear at the shear center then the equivalent shear forces in the flanges will perfectly balance that moment. This is equivalent system. If this were the reactive shear forces in the section then they would have been obviously having to go the other direction. How can we do that? Well, we can weld a plate on the thing like we see in figure 644. Or put a little gusset on the thing over the side like we saw in our prior figure. This equation here, E equals FH over V, once again we have to take with a grain of salt. This will apply to many channel sections. It won't apply to other things. And you really ought to just calculate shear flows and then calculate some moments in a clever manner to verify the correct equation for the shear center. Here's a little example problem where we want to find the shear center. All we do, we start by calculating our I of the section. We're going to need that so that we can calculate our shear flow. If you're already thinking about this, you say, oh, it looks like this is a relatively simple problem. All we need to do is sum moments about this point right here. If we sum moments about here, because we can see if we have a vertical shear, let's pretend it's downward, it's going to be located somewhere. You're going to start seeing that for a C channel, it's going to be located behind this section like this at some point where from here to the center of this part we're going to call that the shear center. But if you get it wrong and put it on the other side over this direction instead, then that's okay because your shear center will just be negative when you calculate it. 
So all we need to do is recognizing we want to sum our points, our moments about point D. All we have to do is say, oh, look, that's going to get rid of any reactive shear flows and forces in this flange. And it's going to get rid of any reactive shear forces in this flange. And, and what we see here is all we're going to be left with is this force. So all we have to do is calculate the shear flow right there. So we say, okay, we're going to take this part right here and take the Q, calculate the Q of that. We're going to calculate the shear flow VQ over I, which is at this point B, Q of B, that gives us the shear flow at B. We turn that into a force by saying the force of the flange is going to be the area under this curve. Since that curve looks like this, what it is is the Q at B times B over 2 since it's triangle that's the force and then we sum the moments about point D they must equal 0 if we want that to be the shear center so we're gonna say okay the force in the flange times the vertical distance which is H from center to center minus because our shear force V is going the other direction the shear center since we drew it to the left uh, times V equals zero and we find E is actually HFF over V where this is the force in the flange that's the distance between the centroid of the flanges and this is our vertical shear. See how easy that is? Let's go ahead and see how Biron Johnson solves this mother. Blah! He just cheats and grabs this equation. That's not recommended because it is uh, while it is true for this particular section, it won't be true for others, and it's going to be hard for you to figure out which it applies to, so it's better to just calculate it. It shows that the force is equal to the integration of the shear flow times dS. That's true, but all we did, recognizing if we truly understand calculus, we recognize this is the same as just calculating the shear flow at point B, since we already know what it, point, what it is at point A. And since that's a nice, simple triangular area, we can do that integration by just taking the area of that triangle to calculate the force and then use the sum of the moments to get our shear center. This shows how we would draw it in figure A here and then how we would show our shear flows. You need to be able to draw your shear flows as shown in figure C here, where we see that uh, not only the magnitude of the shear flows with appropriate sig figs and units, but also what the buildup of those are. So we see by plotting the value at just a few points, for example, calculating this value, and then plot it there and there and there and there, knowing that it builds up in a linear fashion here and here, these are the same magnitude here and here and then we calculate it one more place so we were only to calculate the shear flow one two places we calculate the Q those two places the big Q we use that to calculate the little Q both those places and then we use uh, we can call it clever calculus in order to calculate what the flange forces are now we could have done it for all flanges but in this case, all we really need to do is know the flange force here in order to be able to sum our moments about this point. The other two flanges are going to drop out, so we don't even have to do that unless you're asked for the flange forces. That's how you solve these with understanding and ease. And there's our shear stresses that we can calculate at any point by just taking our shear flow at that point and dividing by the thickness at that point. This is our slide we saw before that just reminds us if we have a triangular area, the area of a triangle, if this is Q right there and this is B, the area under that is just QB. So we can use, so whenever anytime we have a shear flow building up with a triangular area, we can use this relation. If it's building up slower than that we use this relation and if it's building up faster than that we use that relation that will handle 98% maybe more of all shear flow problems
So making sure you can recognize how it builds up. Anytime we have a flange like this, where our, 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 our CG is down here, we can see we're growing our area but not our y bar, only one turn is increasing linearly, that will always give us a triangle. Anytime we're moving through a flange going this direction, like let's say we have a section, here's the CG, like this, we can see we're starting here, we're going to here, we can calculate the shear flow at this point, but what happens is our area is increasing as we move this way, and our Y bar is increasing as we move this way. That means it's going to be building up uh, faster and faster as we move up. That means it's going to be giving a concave, which we're going to use this equation for. Anytime we're coming down toward the CG, we see as we move from, say, uh, here down this way, our area is decreasing and our Y bar is decreasing. So we're moving from one value and usually we're going to start at some value to another value, but both of them are decreasing. So that means it's decreasing faster and faster. Can you see that? So that gives us this kind of area. Being able to recognize those three types of areas or actually uh, one more, whenever we have a lumped assumption, remember we're assuming that the shear flow, when we have a thin web, a thin, thin web, we're assuming the shear flow is constant. It has no axial area, right? It has only shear area. All the flanges have the axial area. That's what that assumption means, which means the shear flow will be constant. If it has no axial area, then their Q doesn't build up as you move through it. So that means if you get a shear flow in it, it's going to stay that constant shear flow. Then if that's the shear flow Q and it's constant, our force is just going to be B times Q. So actually we got four common areas. We've got the rectangular for whenever we have a constant shear flow web. We have the triangular when we have a, a building up steadily web. We have the linear increase and a linear decay equation. This gives us an area of BQ. This gives us an area of one half BQ. This gives us an area of one third BQ. And this gives us an area of two thirds BQ. If you understand this, you're on the road to being able to calculate shear flows rapidly and efficiently with understanding. And you should be able to uh, outperform anybody in a standard mechanics of materials class, whether in aerospace, mechanical, or civil, because they will be trying to do calculus, and you will be using the, you will be also doing calculus, but you'll be doing it efficiently and with engineering judgment. And you will typically be able to run circles around them for calculating meaningful shear flows and shear centers. This is a little example from Brune. I believe we've seen this before. Once again, the key to this is just figuring out what the shear flow at each point is and then calculating the, shear, the flange forces and summing moments. Focusing on that little piece, we get our free body diagram. We saw this for a thin section on an eye section last class. We know we're going to use our eye of the section to calculate our shear flows. This is using a summation calculus with a sign convention in order to calculate it, which we can apply in this manner. Walking through the part at point A, at point B, at point C, at point D, and so on, until we get all the shear flows. Once we have all the shear flows, we can draw them on the section as shown here. We can then turn those into forces and the flanges, and then some are moments to calculate the shear center. Once again, Brune does this often. You want to ask yourself, let's see, are we drawing the equivalent shear flows or the reactive shear flows? If you look at the first figure here, figure A1423 from Brune over to the left, you see we see the force applied at one end of the beam and the reactive shear flows at the other end of the beam. If you look at figure Brune's figure 8, 14, 25, we see what we're plotting here is the 
reactive shear flows and forces and the reactive uh, the reaction. So what we have here is an equivalent system. This is why instead of summing the moments to zero, he's saying R times E is equivalent, that reaction moment is equivalent to the sum of the reactive shear flow moments. Got it? This is showing, going to show our simpler method. Basically, we want the shear flows. And the way we will solve these is first calculate the I. If you can't calculate the I, you're already doomed because you'll be wasting all the rest of your time. That's something you should not have been able to pass statics without being able to do. Calculate I's of typical aeros aerospace sections uh, efficiently. Then we look and say, okay, I have an applied force P like this little figure. These will be my reactive shear flow directions. The quickest way is to say, hey, look, if our force is down, the vertical force in the vertical web better be resisting it. And we know from shear flows that it's like a hose getting bigger and bigger or getting smaller and smaller in the flow, which means if that's the direction in the vertical flange, we know that the lower flange must feed it and the upper flange must bleed it as shown. Having done this, we can see, oh, we can sum our moments about the lower left corner. All we're going to need to do is calculate the force in the upper flange to sum our moments. How do we do that? We can see the upper right point on the section is going to be zero shear flow. And the left end of that flange will be a shear flow that we can easily calculate. And we can use that to calculate the force. We see the shear flow of the two edge, edges are zero as shown here. We then can say, okay, what's the shear flow at point B? We just take the area of that section times the Y minus Y bar of that section. That's our big Q. We can then use, there's our calculation. We can then use, calculate our shear flow, VQ over I. That gives us the magnitude of the shear flow. We already know the direction because we drew it in our first little figure here. We know that that is at point B, so now we know what the direction of that is. Actually, if you want to uh, figure that out directly, you could draw your little free body diagram seeing that the moment is building as we move from, uh, from in the page where the force is applied towards ourselves. That means we get our little delta P on the near end as shown in this little sub figure. That shows the reactive shear flow resisting it as shown on the left face. And because we once we have that face, we saw, see what the other two directions of the shear flows are. That means this section, this part looks like this. You can see the triangular area shown above the thing, and you can see little arrows in the section showing the direction of the shear flow, the reactive shear flow. Actually, this is the equivalent shear flow shown here. Uh, it looks like I've got the wrong arrows. As you can see from our little direction picture here, the shear flow should be going to the right, as we saw in our first sub-figure sketch in the upper middle. So these flows here are shown incorrectly. Let's fix it. That's how that is. We've got this shows us the magnitude. This is the magnitude at this point, and we see it builds up like this. Got it? Now we can calculate the Q at the centroid. All we need to do is going to the centroid, we can calculate the area of this little secondary piece. So we're talking once again about the area of this little piece right here. And we're going to add that to the shear, the Q that we had before. And that gives us the total Q. We then calculate the shear flow as shown on the bottom. That gives us the second one. Now, since this section is symmetric, we know what all the rest are. And we can draw all of our shear flows like this. You can see we've got the zeros shown. We've got the, the shear flows at point C and point B and point A. Make sense? Then we can calculate our flange forces. That's shown here. 
Calculate the area of this little triangle. Calculate the area of that little triangle. Now we have everything. We can draw our section with the force and the forces. Now it's easy for us to see we're going to sum the moments at the lower left, which is shown as point B, little b, and summing our moments we calculate the shear center. This is the way we solve these. Box our answer with proper sig figs. We can redraw the section. Actually the picture shown before is showing forces and force. The picture down below is showing flows and force. Now if you show this as your answer, this little picture to the lower right, you're going to need to also show magnitudes in, uh, on this picture as well. Here's an example for a lump section. When we have a lump section, it's even easier. Let's say we have a section like this with a horizontal force and we want the shear center. Now the hardest part here is to notice since a lot of the text show shear center calculations moving from right to left. This particular shear force is in the horizontal plane. That means the shear center that we're talking about here is going to have to be above or below the CG of the part. So that force remains parallel. See that? So we're going to find the Y position of the shear center in this particular case. To solve this, we're going to need to first be able to calculate our properties of section, which means we're going to take all of the given areas and we're going to take all of the given thicknesses and we're going to draw our little table to calculate our properties. Calculate the area, the Y bar, and the I of the section. Now we've calculated both I's here, but which I do we need for this particular problem? We're bending about what axis? This horizontal force in the x-direction is bending about the y-axis. That means we're going to need the y-moment of inertia. We're going to have v in the x-direction divided by the i about the y-axis times the q of the part that we need to calculate our shear flows. And that's going to be since we're assuming that these are lumped areas and that all the normal loads are carried in the lumped areas at A, B, C, and D and the webs carry none, that means the shear flow in these webs will be constant and will only be affected by, by shear forces, little uh, change in shear force in these flanges. Anytime the flanges have a change in shear force, we will see shear flow developing in the web. This particular problem can be solved quite simply since there's only one web that's that's in the horizontal direction that can react that shear force. That means we can see that the shear flow in web AB is just going to be V over W. So that flow times W will perfectly balance V. And then you can use that to calculate all the rest of the shear flows. However, it may be simpler since you may not have the, probably don't have the engineering judgment yet to figure that out. Just calculate the change in force per unit inch, which means you're going to take V times one inch. That's your unit moment. And then you're going to calculate MC over I. That's the moment about the Y over the I of the Y times a little C value, which is the X minus X bar value and calculate your delta P's, right? Using this equation, we can calculate our delta P and populate our table right there. Now we know what the delta P's are. Now with those delta P's, it's really easy to figure out our shear flows. We'll do that on the next slide. So don't forget what these delta P's are. We're going to use those next. Got it? So last slide we saw this section and we calculated these delta P's. So we're going to start with a free edge whenever we can find one and we'll start drawing our delta P's on the part. So let's start with this one. Let's take uh, this is the entire part shown with all delta P's. We see at point C we've got a tension. At point uh, A we have a tension. At point 
B and D, we have compressive values that we already calculated. Now, you'll notice if the shear is applied as shown, what we've done is gone one inch into the, one inch into the page and seen how that, sh that force in the flange changes. Now we can focus on any free end and calculate our shear flows. Here's how it works. So we're going to start here with point C, the lower left. And we use the 666.7 pound per inch delta P. You can think of that as a force, or you can think of that as a, cha a change in force pounds per inch. Either way, you can solve it. In this particular case, if we imagine that's the pounds per inch, then we can draw our reactive shear flows. We see that QAC has got to react against it. That gives us the other tier flows on the near and far face due to our shear flows being such romantic little guys we then can sum our moments in the into the plane direction which means that 666.7 since that's pounds per inch that's times one inch or just if it's pounds it's just the force value minus the shear flow in the web times one inch is equal to zero you see that the shear flow is just that change in force per unit inch we then can go to the next section which means we're going to go past the net. Now we know that the shear flow in that first web, that's web AC, is constant. So we can go past it, cut the AB web, and draw another section. We have the, the force per inch shown in cap A there. We have the shear flow we already calculated coming from AC, and we now can calculate AB. Summing our forces, we see that QAB is 2,000. We then go past the next little lumped area, and we do it again to calculate the shear flow in web BD. And then we can keep, we can draw or redraw our section. We could go back to D if we just want to check our result and that better balance also. Now that we're done, we can redraw all of these as we'll see on the next slide. There's our cross section with the shear flows drawn and it's convenient to calculate our forces since these are constant flows that's our little rectangular area so it's just a shear flow times a distance shear flow times a distance shear flow times a distance if we now draw those with our horizontal shear we can sum our moments about a convenient point actually point a or b will work equally well i'm going to sum about point a and we see the v times that distance h minus e has got to be equal to and what we're seeing here is we've drawn the equivalent shear flows in the webs rather than the reactive shear flows that's why they're going the same direction that's why we have the equal sign and we calculate our shear center that's how this is done make sense now if we want to show everything if you're asked to redraw these you can draw your section like this You'll notice that we have all of the shear flows shown with appropriate sig figs. Actually, I've got too many sig figs in those cases. That should be 667, 667, and 2000, and E, and the applied shear force. And if you were drawing this for your solution, you'd actually show your E equals 21.3 inches on this picture. Make sense? Got it? Here's another one. This actually looks really simple. And we can see we've only got one web going here. So if we have a vertical force R, then the shear flow better just be R over H. And we can also just use our T equals 2AQ relation. Make sense? This uh, is shown in Brun if you want to study that further. Here's another little example. Now if we have a little section like this, this is already partially solved. We've got a horizontal force R. That's just a force, 200 pounds. You can see your webs are going from A to B, from B to C, and from C to D and D to E. And in this particular case, Brune chose to sum his moments about point O. We could have just as equally summed our moments about point A.
and you can either uh, do this a couple ways you can calculate the forces in each web and then sum your forces your moments due to your forces or you can just calculate the shear flow in each web and use your summation your torque equal to 2aq to solve this in this particular case if we sum our moments about 0.0 we see we're going to uh, this web Q is this uh, web a B is not going to have any effect but all the other webs will you'll notice this particular section has no lumped no lumped areas at all so it's just a constant shear flow web and because this is a constant shear flow web this gets even simpler because the shear force has got to be equal to the shear flow times the horizontal distance that flow applies in. What we're saying here is there's no lumped areas and we just have a web going from here to here, here to here, and here to here. So if we sum our forces, they have to be equal to zero, so R, but actually what we're showing is equivalent system, which means R equals our shear flows, equal the shear flow times it's the distance it travels from here to here well from here to here it's not traveling in that direction at all and from here to here it's not traveling in that direction at all but here it is and here part of it is so we have that times this horizontal distance h which is actually 20. We're using that to say oh well the shear flow is just r over h wow that's simple we didn't have to get more complicated than that we sum our moments we now can sum our moments about this point by saying the summation of the two aqs right the summation of the two aqs and what we have here is if we have this web where these are aligned and we're actually summing from down here what that means is you can do this you can draw a line to your two endpoints so you can do this two a q and then you'd have from here drawing this line to this line, which is this 2AQ, which actually means you can cut to the chase for just by taking all this area here, all of that area times 2 times Q is equal to the torque. What's the area there? Well, it's the area of this triangle plus the area of this rectangle plus the area of that half circle. And that's what we see right here, and that's what we're calculating. That's that area plug into here and that gives us our shear flow. Comprende? All right. That's how that works. We could do it anywhere else and we get the same result. Here's another example. Suppose we have this guy. Now the tricky part here is we have this wacky force 141 which means actually when we calculate our shear center we're going to be looking for like a perpendicular distance so you can see that perpendicular distance shown here what we're saying is since this is applied this way we're going to get a shear center for this part of the force and a shear center for that part of the force or we can just stick with this and calculate that offset eccentricity that it has in order to be balanced and that's what we're seeing right there this is a problem that we probably won't see that much of but this is also shown in Brune and it's kind of useful and that's just solved in the same manner make sense that's all I got for you that's your center make sure you practice this this is a critical skill actually it's fairly simple the way I've shown you study this out try it make sure you understand it do all the homework problems redo them if you need to if you want more reading Beeren Johnson has a number of examples you can study out actually any elementary mechanics and materials text will have examples of calculating shear center most of them are going to focus on the calculus you can use that to help check your answers the way I gave you of calculating shear first moments of the areas big cues turning those into little cues and flange forces and summing moments. That's really the key to shear flows and shear centers. Enjoy. Merry Christmas.